All right then. Okay, I think we'll kick it off then. Um, so firstly, hello everybody. Uh, it is so nice to see quite a few familiar faces as well um, and some new faces. Welcome to the Community of Practitioners launch event. Uh, we are very excited to be here today and we appreciate all of you taking time out of incredibly busy work days we know um, to join us today. So I am Marianne Tay, I think a few of you know me and we'll get to introductions, but Louise Crook is also here if you want to say hello. Hello everyone, it's lovely to see 83 people here today, which is lovely. Excellent. Um, so better go through the agenda for today then so you know what's going to happen for the next um, few hours. Um, but first, oh thank you. So at 12.30 till 1, we're going to do some introductions so that you guys know who we are, you're, who are doing the event with you today. And we also would like to know a little bit about each of you. Nobody panic, we're not going to go through 85 people and ask you to tell us a fun fact about yourselves and who you are. I think that would probably take us up to 4.30 uh, if we tried to do that. So um, we'll just do it through a little bit more of a general check in with each of you. Then James is going to talk to you all about what the PPN is. Hopefully most of you have had to register on the PPN to be here today. So you've had a look at the website and you know a little bit about who the PPN are. So James isn't going to drop any massive surprises during that section. Then we're going to be joined by Liz Kell, who will introduce herself and talk to you a bit about why we have community of practice and why we're setting one up and how we hope that it will help all of you. Then the most exciting part of today is we get to hear from some of you who are going to introduce the different practitioner roles so that we've all got a nice understanding of the four professions that we're all working with and the similarities and differences between each of you. Then Dr Sinny's going to join us at just before three o'clock to do some CPD with all of you and hopefully you're aware from the invite that Nicola sent out that you will get um, a certificate for your CPD and your time today because we know it is valuable um, and hopefully that will be really helpful. Then uh, the lovely Louise Jones is going to round us off at the end of today um, by talking about some future developments and that will be supported by a breakout group activity in which you guys really get to have your voices heard and tell us what you'd like to see in community of practice moving forward. So hopefully as an agenda that sits OK with people and there's no surprises and nobody's now rapidly clicking the leave button thinking what on earth am I doing here um so hopefully that'll take us right up to 4 30 and if not a little bit before so um I'll hand over to Louise who's going to tell us a little bit about herself and how we ended up at the community of practitioners um so yeah thanks Marianne so my name's Louise Crook I'm a highly specialized lead PWP and I work over in the structure Telford and Reiki and talking therapies team um, I trained as a PWP many, many years ago, as you can see from this lovely slide, a good 14 years ago. So I have almost been a PWP for the duration of the profession. So um, I felt quite passionately when I heard about other regions putting together a community of practice where we could actually share learning um, from all of the four different psychological professions. And that is why actually I met with Marianne and we started to think about how we could approach the PPM to see if we could launch that. And we are so grateful we've managed to get to this point to today. Thanks to James and Nicola. And we've got a, such a wonderful turnout. I mean, that number has crept up to 89 people. So we're so pleased, obviously, that you've all can join us today. I'll let Marianne introduce herself now. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, going up and up, which is really good. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I am the course lead of the Mental Health and Wellbeing Practitioner Programme at the University of Worcester, which is our newest practitioner role. So I met with Louise to try and think more about how we can embed the MHWP is better into practice, but also link them up with others who are also practitioners to kind of create that sense of community um, and having been a PWP and led a PWP course as well I had a bit more of an overview of what the practitioner roles were and some of those similarities between the two adult practitioners specifically um, and that's how then I got involved with Louise to try and create this wider community of practice 
Um, so yeah, it's it's really great to see all of you here and thank you again so much for coming. So a little bit of housekeeping then, and I guess for a lot of you who are used to online learning, there should be no massive surprises here. Please do keep your microphones muted at all times, other than when you are in breakout groups. It would be incredibly awkward if you sat there in silence on mute. So do keep them muted in the main room, but turn them on in the breakout groups. Um, otherwise, you get really uncomfortable background noise. I think Nicola wrote in the chat right at the beginning when the link was opened, but just so that everyone is aware, today is being recorded. So whether your um, cameras are on or off is a choice, but during the presentations by the practitioners, if you can keep your cameras off, that would be really helpful and it allows those presentations to be reused without anybody's faces in them. Um, so throughout the day, you can use the chat function to ask any questions, but also don't be shy. You can welcome to put your hand up at any point. Uh, if my lectures are anything to go by, most people prefer to use the chat function, um, but do raise your hand if you feel like you can speak in front of everyone. Um, the hands up feature for those that don't know is kind of like if you look at your screen, it's directly in front of you. It should be at the top in the banner at the top. You've usually got some options that will say chat, Q&A people and then raise is just a little picture of a hand so you can use that. You can also feel free to react to things in the same way. So the button on the next side of that, and I see a few people have worked out how to do the thumbs up and the clapping of the hands. You can react to things that are said as another way of interacting with the presentations throughout the day. Um, so please feel free to use that as it works for you. Goes without saying, as all of you are practitioners, do manage your own well-being throughout the afternoon. We know that staring at screen can be really tough on the eyes. Posture wise, if any of you are like me and don't have the best posture, sitting at the desk is not always helpful for long periods of time. So do just please feel free to take a green break, go to the toilet, grab a drink whenever you need to. The more comfortable you are, the more you're going to get enjoyment out of the afternoon. So absolutely take your own time as your own. Um, as always on Microsoft Teams, we know the tech doesn't always work in our favour. Um, we are all touching wood and hoping that the next few hours run smoothly. But if you do experience technical difficulties, my best piece of advice is turn it off and on again. So please just feel free to leave, come back. The link is open all afternoon. So again, sort your tech problems out as the best way that you need to. Um, but fingers crossed, we're all OK. I think that's it, yeah. So I'm not going to pretend that I am doing this poll because my tech skills are not good enough to be able to set this poll up. But as a way of getting to know you, we have asked that you tell us what role you're in. So whether you're one of the practitioners, which are EMHPs, MHWPs, CWPs and PWPs. Try saying that quickly. And then if you're in any other clinical profession or if you are like me from the education sector. So please, could you just take a moment so that we can get an idea of the uh, demographic that we're working with in this meeting would be fantastic. And then once you've done your profession, we also have all the Midlands regions. So again, it's helpful for us to know which part you're where you're from um, and beyond the Midlands as well. If some of you are not just in the Midlands today, so please do feel free to input your geographic region as well. OK, I think that's the majority of the responses and so good to see um, the spread across the practitioner programmes. 50% PWP, 30% MHWP, 6 CYP and then 13 at other at the moment. So really fantastic to see such a good diverse representation, which is lovely. 95% uh, of us are from the Midlands, which is a good sign, um, which is nice to see. Um, brilliant. OK, so I don't think that we can leave that open, though. If you haven't had a chance to do it, you can fill it out. Um, 
but we will hand, well, I will hand over to James, who is going to talk a little bit now about what the Midlands PPN is. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm James Varsi. I'm the programme manager for the PPN in the Midlands. Um, I'd like to start by giving a, a massive thank you to Marianne and Louise for getting us to this point. Um, if it was a live event, I'd be giving them flowers, but we'll have to make do with a virtual thumbs up. Um, it's great to see such a good turnout today, and hopefully this will be a start of a, of a fantastic community of practice. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the PPN. As Marianne mentioned, I think you should all be members, but if you aren't, please join. Um, Nicola will put a link in the, the chat. Um, so before I discuss the benefits of being in the PPN, it might be useful to give some broader context. Um, the Psychological Professions Networks are commissioned by NHS England to provide a, a joined up voice for the profession. It's free, it's multi-professional, um, and it's for anyone interested in psychological practice in the NHS. But our focus is on bringing together psychological professionals and other stakeholders uh, in order to maximise the benefits of the profession to the public. Um, I think it's important to recognise that the psychological professions have come a long way in recent years. Um, it was only in October 2022 that NHS England appointed a national clinical lead for the psychological professions, uh, and that's Adrian Whittington. Um, and Adrian also leads the PPN nationally. And prior to that time, the psychological professions had been grouped um, within the allied uh, health professional leadership structures. Um, so Adrian's role is vital in facilitating developments within the psychological professions uh, workforce. And it does reflect the growing presence of psychological professionals we have within the NHS. Uh, next slide, please, Molly. So the overarching function of the PPN is to inform, enable and influence NHS commissioned healthcare. And we do that through a range of activities. Uh, we engage and connect with psychological professionals, recognising that we have a stronger voice collectively. Um, and this community of practice will be a good example of that. Um, as it will give us an opportunity to pass information to you, receive information from you, and then we have, you know, influence a range of levels to, uh, you know, try and improve um, how things move forward within the profession. So a lot of our work focuses on advising policymakers, workforce planners and commissioners within NHS healthcare. Uh, with a view to supporting the safe and effective expansion of the existing and the new psychological professional roles. Um, and we'll touch on those uh, shortly. Um, the PPN is made up of, of quite a small national team and then seven regional networks covering the whole of England. Um, before I go further into our work, I wanted to play a brief video which gives a good overview of the PPN. kinds of psychological professions in the UK, but they don't always speak as a group. And this means they can get pushed into the background. Mental health is essential to every part of our health and well-being. As the World Health Organization says, there's no health without mental health. That's why the Psychological Professions Network was born. We're a multi-professional network that gives a voice to all psychological practitioners who work with NHS patients. By working with planners and commissioners, we help raise awareness of how psychological approaches can improve patient care. We also provide a destination that anyone can come to for advice and support about the psychological professions. It's our mission to make sure everyone knows how important psychological health and well-being is in our day-to-day -day lives, especially in the NHS. For instance, did you know 
one in five older people are affected by depression, rising to 40% when living in a care home. One in four adults will experience at least one diagnosable mental health problem in any given year. And one in 10 children, aged five to 16. Or did you know that during pregnancy and the first year after childbirth, one in five mothers will experience depression or anxiety? And that half of all mental health problems have been established by the age of 14? Stigma and old-fashioned ideas are still holding back care, but it doesn't have to be this way. We want to prove how much healthier everyone can be if psychological professionals are involved at the right time. We're working to make sure everyone understands the dual importance of physical and mental health and the relationship between the two, and to help patients have choice and take more control over their psychological treatments. As well as giving advice and sharing ideas through our members, we help clinical research get put into practice and champion clinical excellence. We're also helping to create the next generation of NHS leaders. We support research and innovation, influence health strategy and policy, promote psychological well-being for everyone across all sections of society, including more marginalised groups, create links with academic institutions and professional bodies, work together in co-production with experts by experience, and promote new ways of learning. Over time, as the network grows, it will respond to ideas and interests from all kinds of places. Becoming a member gets you access to all these things. In the future, in every new healthcare situation, we want people to ask, how do psychological approaches play a role? And know that our knowledge and skills are available for anyone that needs them. You'll find more about what we do, as well as our busy calendar of events, discussions and consultations, on our website. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Um, so as highlighted in the video, equality, diversity and in inclusivity are core values within our work. Uh, and we undertake a range of activities to promote these values. Um, I'll just delve a little deeper into uh, the, the breadth of work that we do, uh, which is shaped by the aspirations of the NHS long term workforce plan uh, and these five strategic priorities. So firstly, we work to support the ongoing transformation in psychological health care, because I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware already that there's unprecedented growth ambitions the aim being to grow the number of psychological professions, professionals in the NHS by 65% um, in a four year period. Um, so we support the development and communication of uh, career paths and further development opportunities uh, for all psychological professions, um, such as the new apprenticeship routes into roles. We work to help diversify the profession, um, ultimately, so that the psychological professions are more representative um, of the communities that we serve. And then in terms of leadership, I've mentioned about the presence of um, a national clinical lead for the psychological professions. Um, we're working with colleagues across integrated care systems uh, in the Midlands to ensure that there's also the right leadership um, at a regional level and also a local level within uh, NHS trusts. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the leadership roles that we have now called uh, a Chief Psychological Professions Officer, that's CPPO, and they're kind of at the top of the leadership pyramid within NHS trusts where there are psychological professional, uh, professionals. Um, Finally, we have the priority to transform. So we support this in very various ways, um, developing and ma maintaining this community of practice um, is one example of, um, of that. And in addition to this community of practice that we're sponsoring, we also have um, one in development for clinical associates in psychology um, 
and also uh, that's in addition to our community of practice for for cppos so the uh, uh, chief psychological professions officers in uh, nhs trusts across the midlands and we've also got a community of practice emerging for psychological professionals involved in physical health care. Oh, I think we need to mute somebody there. Oh, thanks. Um, so moving on to um, the vision statements that we have uh, on this slide here, which are represented by planets. Um, th these essentially connect with the strategic priorities that I've just talked through. Um, and ultimately, we want to, to see NHS healthcare that is completely psychologically informed, uh, with psychological practice being at the heart of, of healthcare. And really, when you think about it, this is quite a paradigm shift away from mental health care and physical health care being seen as distinct from one another. Uh, this should be a, a seamless kind of integration um, of these areas. And this is a wider, uh, this is wider than growing a workforce of psychological professionals. It's also about upskilling other healthcare professionals, whether that's nurses, healthcare assistants, or occupational therapists, or you know, the wide range of other roles in the NHS uh, to, de to, to deliver healthcare in a psychologically informed way. Um, next slide, please, Molly. Um, so this is who we are as a team. It's a it's an evolving team. Um, all of the team members are part time. Uh, Sunny will be joining us later, and, and as, as well as being our chair, she's the the CPPO for Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust, um, and she's also the lead for the the Birmingham and Solihull Integrated Care System. Uh, psychological professions faculty. Um, like many of the PPN chairs, she wears a number of hats. And Liz Kell, who's joining us uh, uh, shortly, is also a PPN chair and uh, CPPO. So I work two and a half days a week. Molly uh, joined the team last week and will be working with us three days a week. Nicola just works one day a week. And then we have our leadership fellows um, who's, who are all senior clinical psychologists, um, some of them CPPOs, um, who work for us uh, for only half a day a week. So it looks like a lot of people, but <laughs> it, in reality, it's, uh, it's, it's not that many. Um, and the Midlands region is huge. We have the largest regional patch in England, which includes 11 integrated care systems. 40 NHS trusts and over 100 higher education institutions. Um, so it, it, it's a, a lot of a lot of systems to kind of try and connect and, and support. Uh, next next slide, please, Molly. I wanted to quickly touch on the careers map on the PPM website, although it's not directly relevant to you know today's launch event. Uh, it, it does show many of the new psychological professional roles um, and the roles fall into three group groupings, which currently stands at over 19 plus roles. Um, we have uh, four different psychological practitioner roles talking today, but there is a fifth called the uh, youth intensive psychological practitioner. And this is a role which I, I believe is, is still in a pilot stage. I think we have about 60 in England so far um, and none of them in the Midlands. Although I did see that someone had kind of um, indicated that they're a, uh, a yip. So we may well be tracking you down um, later on. Uh, so Nicola will put a link to the careers map in the chat if anyone's interested in looking at that. And, and, and essentially you can click on the, the different clouds which represent each role. And you can see what's what's needed to get into that role, what the what the career path looks like. Um, next slide, please, Molly. OK, so now's my uh, sales pitch, although I, I think by virtue of you being here today, you'll hopefully all be members already. But just to summarise, I guess, you know, the benefits of being a member. Firstly, the, the fact that it's free kind of begs the question of why not be a member, really. 
uh, you'll be part of a network of psychological professionals regionally, uh, but also nationally, and we help you to stay informed with our regular bulletin. So uh, we send a bulletin out every two weeks, and that includes key information on training, funding, um, careers, development opportunities, um, as well as information disseminated from NHS England and the professional bodies and other stakeholders that we routinely work with. Um, you'll be made aware of emerging communities of practice, other groups, initiatives and events that we, we hold. Um, for example, we have Psychological Professions Week every year in November, um, and that has face-to-face -face and remote sessions. Uh, both in the Midlands and also also uh, nationally. Um, and finally, it gives you the opportunity to connect with psychological professions, uh, professionals across the Midlands and across England through these events. And, um, you know, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you know, it, it just gives a, a, an added strength to us as individuals, you know, to, to have a collective voice through uh, through groups such as this uh, this community of practice. And we're always open to suggestions for initiatives to further develop the profession. Um, I mentioned before, you know, we've got additional communities of practice. We've got the one for the CPPOs, uh, one establishing now for uh, uh, physical health care and also an emerging one for, for clinical associates in psychology. Um, if any of you have got further ideas uh, about communities of practice that would be beneficial, um, I know in other regions, for example, in, in Leeds um, and, uh, and and uh, the the North East Yorkshire region, um, they are uh, running a, a community practice for anti-racism. So, you know, that, that's something we'd be very keen to take forward if there were people who wanted to support that. Um, next, next slide, please, Molly. So finally, my final slide, it, this concludes my overview. Um, some data there on the screen just to illustrate, you know, our achievements over the past three years uh, since we've been functioning in the Midlands. Uh, you can see our membership there is, is well, as of December, it was 2,246. Um, it'd be well over uh, 2,300 now. Uh, so please encourage co colleagues to join if they haven't done so already. And uh, thanks for listening. If anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I think we're we're running ahead of time at the moment, aren't we? So um, feel free to uh, ask away. Thanks, James. I think probably what I would like to add to that as well as when me and Marianne first started to talk about this space and the community of practice, it felt really important to have a space for all of the psychological practitioners to come together as a community, to start sharing knowledge, understanding, best practice, to really enhance our skills and, and lift our voices. Because I think that quite often can be missed in the very busy work that we're doing every day and we can feel quite isolated in our different silos and different teams but actually just looking at how many are here today and we're all being members of the PPN the PPN can support us to really listen and use our voices and really start to enhance our skill sets completely yes uh, yeah thanks Louise that's a really good point um, and, and again, you know, if, if there are distinct ideas for, for other ways of connecting to, to address particular themes within uh, psychological health care, um, you know, we'd really like to hear from, from you around that. And, you know, connecting in other ways to kind of facilitate those discussions is, uh, is, is where we can help to, to take things forward. And I think so, from the education side of it, sorry, James, just to pick up on what you said, because I know that we're called community of practice and then we've got our, all our educators in here, was because, and all of you know this figure and experience, 
when you're a trainee, you're very linked with the university. But once you qualify, your links waver a little bit. But we keep training up the workforce. So then there's a bit of a disconnect at the moment where we train you with the equipment and the curriculum that we've got. And then we don't actually know what it's like in practice sort of two years on because we lose those links. So the hope behind the community of practice from our sort of education side of it is that we can consistently and continuously get feedback from you and then we can help inform the training course based on how it's actually going in practice two years post qualifying rather than just capturing you as trainees. Um, and for example, I know we're going to hear from one of my MHWPs today who's like over year on and I would probably have lost some of those links without spaces like this. So we are hoping it will also inform training for PWPs, MHWPs and the other practitioners along the way as well. Thanks James. Yeah and I, I, I think because we have you know the emerging roles such as the uh, youth intensive psychological practitioner role it's very hard for them to establish a community of practice, given that they're the so few in number nationally. Um, so ha having this practitioner level um, community of practice where, you know, practitioners can discuss and contrast their roles and, and, and how they work and what benefits them in their practice. Uh, it will really help to kind of proliferate different ideas around how 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 you all work. So I'm just looking down the uh, the list of people on the call to see if we we have Liz um, uh, joining us yet, and we we if if we do, we can maybe. Uh... Sounds good for me. Okay, hi everyone. So um, my name is Liz Kell, and I am co-chair of the Psychological Professions Network in the Northwest, as you can see. Um, and thank you to Marianne and Louise for inviting me to speak today. Um, I am a psychological wellbeing practitioner by background and I think the reason Marianne and Louise invited me to come along was because we've done a lot of work with community practice psychological practitioners and psychological well wellbeing practitioners um, in the northwest so just going to share a little bit about our history and what we've learned about it if that's okay. So um, I'm going back quite a long time now but before the psychological professions network existed so back in kind of 2010-ish, um, we did have some informal PWP networks in the Northwest. To be honest, they were mainly facilitated through what were then IAC regional teams. They delivered some masterclasses, but it was quite small and it, we didn't really get to do more than that. But when the PPN Northwest launched in 2013, for the first time, that kind of gave us a home and an opportunity to really properly establish um, what was then a senior PWP group, but with reach out to a wider PWP network. And we did a number of things through that network, mainly through the seniors group, but then with the kind of wider sign off and buy in from the PWP network across the Northwest. So just listed a few of our achievements. So myself and Katie, who was co-chairing the network at the time, published a discussion paper on PWP registration through the IAPT Practice Research Network. And look, 10 years on, we have registration. It's like a miracle happened. Um, we also developed a PWP code of conduct, and that was adopted by a number of IAP services across the Northwest. That felt like a really valuable piece of work to have that when we were still a, a workforce without a registration at that point. And then the third really big thing that we did was to support an update on person specs for trainee PWPs, PWPs, and senior PWPs. And that was very much with a focus on trying to support widening access. So to really give the quality of recruiting people at level six or level seven, that kind of having a psychology degree didn't get you extra points through a shortlisting criteria and to really help try and diversify the workforce. So we did do lots of other things as well, but they felt like our three biggest achievements, really, that I really wanted to share with you today. Um, and yeah, really, for me, more than anything, it facilitated the opportunity of a formal network for the first time and to really think about how we came together across a region to share best practice. Um, and at the time, there weren't a huge number of senior PWPs around. It was still a growing role. And so often, if you were a senior PWP, you were the only one in your service. So for that senior PWP group in particular, it really gave an opportunity to 
network with other senior PWPs and think about the specifics of your role and what that might need to be. Um, it also meant that myself and my colleague Katie as co-chairs had a seat at the Psychological Professions Network Workforce Council. So it really gave us a voice into different conversations. Um, it helped us to raise awareness of the new role. There were often a lot of clinical psychologists found or sat around that table and you know they said how much they valued having a different voice being there as well and I kind of quickly identified some allies in the councillors who were sat at that table as well who often also felt a bit on the sideline of some things and developments which was really nice and it just provided an opportunity to be involved in wider developments and that real influence for the benefits of PWPs and we could provide that kind of conduit of consulting the PWP workforce and taking that back to the Workforce Council and really sharing the views and the voice of the PWP workforce of themselves. So 10 years is a long time. Um, and over time, that community of practice had possibly lost a little bit of momentum, shall we say, um, not least because I rudely went and had a baby in the middle of it. And while I was on maternity leave, everything seemed to grind to a halt a little bit. But so we kind of, st I stepped up to be co-chair of the um, of the network in October 21. So I very much needed to hand the reins over to somebody else at that point. So that led to some conversations about what we actually wanted it to be. And obviously since then, there's been a huge growth in the number of different practitioner roles. So I've always been a big believer that we're stronger together and that there are there is enough commonality between us to have a psychological practitioner workforce identity as well as still having space for our differences. So in December 22, we had a kickstart event for a new psychological practitioner community of practice. So to kind of not to start from scratch exactly, but to refresh and to regroup and to put, bring together all of the different psychological practitioner roles into one group and to provide some different opportunities for us to learn together, to share from experience and as I say to have that real unified practitioner workforce and, and the strength in numbers of that collective voice really. So um, I don't believe there is a one-size-fits-all approach, you, it absolutely has to be right for your region and for your members at our kickstart event we spent a lot of time talking about what people wanted from the network what it could look like what a community of practice meant really in the end we've ended up with a structure where we have four co-chairs so we've got a co-chair representing each of the different practitioner roles and they've kind of formed a little steering group really we have um, regular meetings information sharing newsletters it's still quite new it's still a work in progress and as I say, it's really important that it is what the members want it to be. And I think that value of the flexibility in its approach, although a community of practice is for the whole, there can still be smaller groups within it that respond to needs. So whether that is still about having a senior PWP network or a senior group that goes across different practitioner roles or perhaps a piece of work that's relevant to only one practitioner role. But I think there's been so many different silos across the practitioner roles actually that strength in bringing us together sharing what our challenges have been what we've overcome I still think that the psychological practitioners psychological well-being practitioners haven't figured everything out but we have overcome some challenges that are probably going to be useful for the newer roles to hear about so let's offer a space to share that um, I just wanted to finish really by talking a bit about the the kind of ethos behind what communities of practice are um, because they are a very evidence-based thing and I think it's really important for us to kind of keep this in mind as we are setting community of practice up. It really is about that coming together with the shared interest to fulfill both individual and group goals with the ultimate aim of doing better. Often the focus is on sharing best practice but also around creating new knowledge and that ongoing interaction with members is so important as part of that. And they require a real reliance on collaborative environments to communicate, to connect and to conduct community activities. And really it provides a system of collective critical inquiry and reflection. That idea that none of us is as good as all of us. So I think what I would really ask you all to think about at, at this starting point is 
not just what you want to get out of it, but also what you can bring and what what will happen. I know from my own experience that if it all gets left to one or two people, it doesn't work. It does need to be a whole community and it does need to be about you thinking about what, what your offer is within that as well. And, you know, we all know that there is a fairly high turnover within the practitioner workforce as well. So always holding in mind that kind of succession planning and, and how you keep that work moving forward and keep that community moving forward and fresh is definitely something that I would say is really important for the development of them. I think that was all my slides. Is there anything that anybody wanted to ask me or anything before I leave you to continue? Ali, hello Ali. Hi Liz, nice to see you and thanks very Thank much you. for that. I was just wondering, have you had any um, challenges uh, within the, the groups and what, what have they been and how might we overcome them, I guess? Um, to be honest, the biggest challenge was probably having a kind of stable number of people leading it and doing the work because, and as I say, you know, we did start this group back in 2013 and I think possibly the turnover of staff was even higher then. We initially found that, I don't want to say this in a bad word, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious and wanting to move on. But I felt that sometimes people put them forward, themselves forward to be involved so they could put it on the CV and then use it to get onto the next thing rather than actually being committed to the work. And, you know, everybody has their ambitions and moves on and changes jobs, myself included. There is nothing wrong with that. But I guess that's why it's important to think about it from the start of that succession planning of how you, you know, as we've restarted ours, we've got our co-chairs on a two year review so that every two years we'll have another vote and we'll be elect people. And sometimes that might be the same people, but it also gives opportunity for new people to come in, but also gives that clear message that we want this to continue to evolve and to grow and to develop. I think that was probably our biggest challenge is just keeping the activity going. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Liz. Maybe something we can think about in the groups later. Thanks. Anything else that people want to I guess the other thing just to end, um, obviously there's a number of different practitioner community of practice. Oh, sorry, James, saw your hand go up. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I was trying to unmute then. <clears throat> um, I, I wondered if you could just give us a bit of a flavor of, of, of how things have, have run since your um your your sort of kickstarter events and i know you, you've brought elspeth into the team as well um who, who's taking a role role with that um I, I guess in terms of shaping how we we move our community of practice forward it would be good to, to you know to, to to learn a little bit more about how things look for you at the moment yeah so yeah so elspeth is one of the four co-chairs um and by kind of coincidence, really, she's also then taken on a role within the PPN as um, a new roles leadership fellow this over this last 12 months, um, which I suppose has probably given her the nice opportunity of having a bit more freedom to get involved in things. I think sometimes one of the challenges is that is people having capacity within their work day to actually get involved in these things um, and to have the space to do it. So that sometimes has meant that we've done events in an evening or at lunchtime to try and ensure that they're flexible. We are mainly doing online things because they are generally more achievable for people to attend. We did decide to do the, the first one as kind of a bit of a kickstart. We've also decided um, at that first event that we had in person, we had a CPD session as part of it. And that worked really nicely that especially because we do now have registers and we do have CPD requirements. I think sometimes being able to include a CPD element helps people to get the support to attend things and to do that. But I think it is, what I would say is it doesn't happen fast. And some of it is just about allowing it to develop organically as well and responding to what people say. But I think maintaining some form of regular comms, whether that's a regular newsletter or whatever that looks like, I think really helps 
because otherwise there's a risk that it just slips off people's radar because they've not heard about it for a while and they can you know we're all we all live in very busy systems don't we so yeah i think that will be an important aspect about how you maintain that that level of communication and we've got a page on our psychological professions network website that's dedicated that's like a psychological practitioner community of practice page so that means we can share the resources there from events and the newsletters and it just gives a bit of a home for sharing things as well yeah, and we, we've got some breakout groups planned for, for, for later on in the event today to, uh, you know, to get the views of everyone in the room, really, about how they think it would best be be, be kind of shaped, really. Um, we, we were tentatively thinking about a, a quarterly event based on what people think. And I think you're right, having CPD helps to anchor it in people's kind of calendars then as well and, and get freed up by uh, by their managers to be able to attend on that basis. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask about your um, community practice being every six months, the, the meetings. Do, does that cause any issue there? Because I guess striking a balance between, you know, not wanting, wanting to make it too frequent as to, you know, uh, put people off from being able to commit to attending versus having quite a long gap in between meetings. Uh, how does that kind of work? It, it's a challenge and I don't know if we've got it right yet or not really I think we're just still trying it out and seeing how it works um we might change it again we've talked about kind of having proper events every six months but maybe smaller kind of drop in update contact points that can be a bit more informal and allow breakout rooms and conversations in between that maybe gives a bit more of a balance um but I think some of it is about six months goes really fast doesn't it you think it sounds like a really long time and then it's upon us before we know it and obviously we had psychological professions week and we were presenting as a community of practice as part of that so i think it's kind of lining it up against all the other events that people might be going to as well that it's amazing how quickly the diary fills up isn't it it is yeah thank, thank, thanks for that liz i think marianne's got her hand uh, up again yeah um so thank you so much that was so useful and i could like how you talked about it, it was PWP is first for a long time and then in that 10 years there was all this growth in these three now four new practitioner roles in um I was wondering what are the some of the benefits that you've noticed Liz of bringing those roles together and kind of moving away from just being in silo just PWPs and now you've got these four co-chairs that work closely together and represent these different practitioners what are some of the benefits you've seen in the last year from that I think particularly for the newer roles really helping address some of the isolation I think you know I really remember we did have our first event in person and there were a relatively small number of MHWPs there but they were all saying how helpful they found it to kind of see people further on down the line who'd got through those first hurdles of being in a new role that they were then experiencing and that ability that actually we might be able to help support and share some learning about how we overcame those things I think that felt really important and and there are some things that we are going through together so obviously the registration was launched first for PWPs but as the accreditation for the CWP and EMHP sorted they can now register we're nearly at the process of MHWPs being able to register so I think going through those processes and sharing our learning I don't really believe in reinventing the wheel unless we need to like there's so much that does apply across and there'll be other things that absolutely don't that are unique to this specific role and that's absolutely fine but I think having that I, I remember so I started 20 years ago as what was then a primary care graduate mental health worker which kind of became the PWP role and I was the very first person in that role and it's so isolating at times and actually to be able to talk to people who've gone through something similar and have had those experiences and learned different ways of dealing with those challenges and finding your way through those relationship difficulties of landing in a new role among people who can be a bit suspicious of you or wondering what your role's about to you know getting to the place where when you're in a talking therapy service everybody knows what a PWP is now but you know we've come a long way in those 20 years and we should be sharing that learning for all the roles not just keeping it to ourselves. Yeah I think that's a, a massive part of definitely what 
what makes the community of practice so important is the newer roles are, are feeling all this uncertainty right now, but the ones before them did also feel it. So not feeling like you're on your own with that. And I think from an education perspective, as I'm sure people in the room will agree, the curriculums for the four practitioner roles are not widely different at all. They're in different settings, which we'll hear about when the practitioners represent it. But, you know, certainly PWP and MHWP have a lot of overlaps in the curriculum and the modules. And I think so do EMHP and CYP. So building off your the fact that your baseline knowledge is quite similar just in different settings I'm sure there's so much learning that can be taken away from that um thank you so much for that Liz yeah and I think that's something that you can find like with the CPD as well like choosing CPD focuses that do have commonality across rather than being specific to one role and it makes you realize just the commonalities they are well it, I hope you have a really good day and I look forward to hearing more about it and you know, there are practitioner community of practice across, I think, all seven PPM regions now. So, you know, I know that Elspeth and the co-chairs in the Northwest are really keen to think about how we link together as well and share opportunities across us. So, yeah, do keep in touch. Thanks very much, Liz. Bye, Liz. Thank you. Bye. OK, so I think we are a little bit ahead of schedule, but we are, we can just go into the next section because then that will give you a longer break in the middle of the day, um, which might be quite needed. So the next section of today is to go through the practitioner roles and we have asked some wonderful representations from each of the four practitioners to talk to us a little bit about their role and just to give some context to why we're doing this links off really nicely from what Liz just said which is the four practitioner roles have all been introduced into the NHS mental health workforce at different times the longest standing which Louise is a representation of is the PWP role that has been going for over a decade and then we had the children's and the education practitioners and then most recently in 2022 the introduction of the mental health wellbeing practitioners so it's been a sort of timeline of practitioner growth and the model that's used for each of those roles is quite similar and the curriculums and the baseline level of knowledge as I've said is quite similar so there's loads of learning that can be done across those roles which is why we're really keen to do this community of practice because I know for MHWP specifically who I work with it is quite isolating to go into a brand new service where they don't know what a practitioner is and have to vouch for yourself and advocate for yourself so it's nice to be around people that have actually already had to do that so we're hoping that these presentations will give everybody in the room a nice understanding of the similarities and the differences between the practitioner roles so I will stop talking about the benefit of it and let you actually listen to it. So I believe we're starting with the wonderful Louise as our PWP. Wow, thank you, Marianne. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Louise Jones. Um, I'm one of the chairs of this community of practice um, and I am a PWP. In fact, I'm a senior PWP and I'm in Shropshire, Telford and Rekin, and I'm very pleased to be here, but daunted because, um, well, it looks like best part of 50% of you are psychological wellbeing practitioners and I'm going to tell you what you're up to but I do appreciate it's a benefit for everybody because I'm really looking forward to hearing from other well-being practitioners as well after me um so thank you Molly can you move on the slide thank you um so the invention of the PWP so I put a quote completely new beast and this is something that I found in an interview with um David Clark and I thought oh that's an interesting way of describing a PWP, but we were invented um, from my understanding. Um, what was appreciated was this deficit of um, appropriately trained um, therapists um, for people who were presenting in primary care 
with mild to moderate anxiety and depression. Um, ultimately, IOP was created to sort of um, remedy this. Um, I'm not going to go into too much of the backstory. I think we all know where it came from. Equally, if you know more than me, you're welcome. Come at me in the chat. But um, the four fathers, four parents, of this, um, Richard Layard and David Clark, an economist and a psychologist, um, came together and sort of developed um, what we now know as IAPT and also the PWP role. Um, so it was low intensity CBT, in essence, is what PWPs were developed for and delivering in the services that we have today. Um, because they saw the benefits of that guided self-help or low intensity CBT, however you want to describe it. Um, thank you, Molly. So the training for a PWP, there's a couple of routes now, um, which is great. There's the trainee PWP route, but also the apprenticeship, which I think is fantastic. It's really the apprenticeship um, that I've obviously helped train apprentices through in service um, has really broadened out the scope of the PWP role and the people um, that want to come into the role. And I think it's been a great benefit um, to our service in particular, but I think as a PWP practitioner role itself. Um, accredited with um, the BPS and um, obviously the training is in low intensity psychological interventions. Um, the big thing for us is being trained in the assessments. So the specifically module one is all about um, how we assess patients um, for anxiety and depression. Um, and the new cur curriculum that we have today includes like ERP for OCD and behavioural experiments as well, which is fantastic that it's broadening out for the curriculum. Um, but it also means that actually further training for the PWPs that have been around for a bit, who may not have this training, is needed as well. Um, so that's training for a PWP. Thanks, Molly. Um, how to identify a PWP. So, um, you can find us delivering low intensity CBT in high volume, typically within an NHS talking therapies service. We roam about. We're not always in an NHS um, talking therapies service. Prisons, for example. Um, we work with adults. That's probably um, a difference with other people. Um, I put here this can be from age 16. Um, particularly in our service, I know that we take that from age 16. Uh, usually we do the assessments for a service. Um, I know that doesn't always, that isn't always a case, should I say. We have the higher intensities doing assessments as well. Um, what a PWP will be doing is one-to-ones and delivering um, computerised CBT and the groups as well. Face-to-face -face telephone and video. Um, a full time PWP will be looking at 18 to 20 clinical contact hours a week. That's what we do. Thank you, Molly. Um, so this is, I suppose, where we sit and obviously there'll probably be differences with the other well-being practitioners as we come into that is we are primary care. So we're um, there facing out into the community. Um, patients are encouraged to self-refer straight in to a service um, and we do normally work within a step care model as I said some people um, work within other services but that's essentially what we're there for to be part of primary care and step two of primary care so um, the principle being the least intrusive for patients and the most effective treatment is um, what a step two service will be offering in the first instance. There are exceptions and we've been, um, it's a, a lot clearer I think now hopefully than it's ever been. So the exceptions being 
social anxiety and PTSD isn't step two appropriate and will go straight to step three um, in most step care services. Um, and as Liz said, she was a real champion for the registration of PWPs and um, that's what we have now. So um, all PWPs are required to register annually once they're qualified. Um, you can register with the BPS, you can register with the BABCP. Um, there are, there are requirements for PWPs now to have that regular case management and clinical skills supervision, um, but which, to be fair, we've always had um, as PWPs. Um, keeping up with our CPD as well, which um, we've got a, um, a lovely bit of that this afternoon, which is great. Um, and with the registration, it is about, and I think Liz was alluding to this, um, maintaining standards of conduct, performance and ethics, um, which is really important to be a practitioner. So once you become qualified as a PWP, where do you go? So um, long term health conditions training is um, advised, encouraged, needed, I think, once you're a PWP. Beyond that, um, supervisor training, um, the role of senior PWP, once you've got that supervision training is there. Broadening out now, which I think is really exciting, is the opportunity for PWPs to specialise in specific areas. For example, in our service, we have um, community um, PWPs, which is so valuable in obviously access rates, but that can broaden out into other areas of specialism. Um, and I think that's really um, exciting and makes when we talk about retention, which I think has already been mentioned so far this afternoon, I think um, it's really important for PWPs to stretch out, broaden out, specialise um, and all those things, because um, it's really valuable for patients. Um, there are opportunities in leadership um, if you want to branch out more operationally. Um, that's a space to go, but also lead PWPs. There's um, a lot of them about that are sort of taking the step to clinical lead as well as um, highly specialised PWPs, um, which we have here this afternoon as well. A fantastic um, role uh, for people when they want to think about staying with, as a PWP and being able to make that um, promotion within the PWP role rather than, and I put it here because as we know, um, there is obviously high intensity training, but we don't need to to dwell on that we know it's there as well so good afternoon everyone I appreciate your valuable time for today's presentation um, so my name is Anika and I represent the first cohort of MHWPs in Birmingham and Solihull so I work in secondary care mental health services and I'm based at a community mental health team in Erdington so today is going to be a 10 minute presentation, just exploring the pivotal role played by the mental health and wellbeing practitioners within Birmingham and Solly Hall. So the agenda today will just to be um, to look at the role of the MHWPs within and beyond clinical practice, the referral pathway, the array of psychological interventions that we provide, and finally, just some client feedback and some data to share. Um, next slide, please, Ali. Perfect. Um, so research on the preferences of service users regarding psychological interventions in the context of NHS mental health services um, varies. And however, a general overview of studies and data indicate a desire for low intensity CBT interventions among service users. So common feedback from individuals struggling with severe mental health difficulties consistently reveal key themes. So they want to be heard, they want to have their experiences validated, be acknowledged as a whole beyond diagnosis, offered an array of psychological interventions as part of their comprehensive care package. So these themes form the foundational principles of the MHWP role. Next slide, please. So the role, what is it? 
So the mental health and wellbeing practitioner role has two main purposes. So the first one is to support people with severe mental health difficulties, their families and carers with collaborative care planning. Um, the second is to provide people with severe mental health problems with wellbeing focused psychological interventions based on the best available evidence. So I've been tasked with giving you guys a glimpse into our daily routines and almost like a day in the life of MHWP. So being part of the Gen Z, um, I, tried to I tried to create a quick 30 second TikTok video to demonstrate this. I hope it works. I hope the sound works, but let's have a go. Okay, it was only a 30 minute clip, but I hope that gave you a little bit of a glimpse in what a day in the life looks like. Um, so just quickly, um, the work week for mental health and wellbeing practitioners is quite dynamic. We are trained to assess and work with severe mental health difficulties, and we commonly work with clients who present with diagnosis um, such as bipolar, schizophrenia, severe depression, personality disorders, dual diagnosis, EUPD, that, course, that kind of things. Um, we also attend weekly MDT meetings. We manage a caseload of up to 18 clients along with weekly psychological interventions. Again, um, similar to both the EMHWP and the PWPs, we offer around six to nine sessions um, about weekly or a week, every week and a half or an hour. Um, we assess and manage risk. Um, we facilitate group sessions um, and also engage in intervention activity within the community. So this is just quickly our referral criteria. As you know, the MHWP role is still in its infancy. A lot of things are still being established um, and created. Um, so this is something that um, within the MHWP network that we've created together. Um, and it just encompasses um, pretty much um, the suitability criteria to work with an MHWP. So is the presentation suitable for secondary care? Is now the right time for the intervention? So ensuring their stable risk, low social stressors, not in crisis. And substance misuse is managed. Um, does the service user have specific goals related to one of the MHWP interventions? And has the service user agreed to the referral being made? So to refer to an MHWP, um, the clinician will need to take the client to the MDT. Um, and most likely with um, a lot of the MHWPs, we will sit um, in the MDTs um, within our service and base. So um, they would have to bring the client to the MDT for discussion of presenting concerns, potential interventions and the service users goals. Next slide, please. Um, so I would like to present to you or um, recall 10 scores. So um, over the past six months, um, these uh, are patient report outcome measures that MHWPs use to track client progression. Um, so I just wanted to uh, show a little bit of the data. So 76% out of the 34 clients recall scores improved from their first to last sessions and 24% of the clients scored above the clinical range, indicating a recovering quality of life, which is great. Next slide, please. So what do the MHWPs do in terms of interventions? So um, the MHWPs interventions focus on goal setting, mood and motivation management. So these interventions include behaviour activation, emotional regulation, graded exposure, problem solving, improving sleep slash sleep hygiene, building confidence, and um, we also offer guided self-help for bulimia and binge eating disorder. Next slide, please. Um, so I would also like to share some positive feedback from clients who have completed interventions and been discharged from the MHWP service over the past four months. So um, we've seen that I've learned to understand uh, what I'm feeling, what I can do to target the motion and what can help. I'm excited and feel like a strong lady. I feel like my mental health is stronger and I feel strong willed. The sessions were helpful. I feel like I'm doing a lot more within my day and keeping busy. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on to kind of the development of MHWPs and bringing kind of my presentation to a swift ending. Um, so we have had various training opportunities in line with our role. This included um, a two day DBT um, skills training course. We've also done sleep and worry training. Um, we have been collecting our CPD hours, doing fundamental trainings through the trust as well. 
Um, peer support groups is also something that um, a lot of the MHWPs have been working on. Um, we've been able, we've been given the opportunity to offer peer support to other trainees across the NHS. Um, group facilitation. So MHWPs are now taking on group facilitation roles. Um, so some of the MHWPs have worked alongside Recovery College to um, do this training um, and now offer um, support and intervention groups within clinical practice and alongside other clinicians. And finally, the MHWP network. So this was established from our reflective groups. And again, like we said, we're the first cohort of MHWPs across Birmingham and Solly Hall. We see each other once every two months for reflective group practices. Like you, like you all pretty much know, you know, being the first of your kind in the service can be difficult and can be slightly isolating and trying to embed and champion our role can be quite difficult and it's presented with many of its challenges. Um, so we have the MHWP network now, which um, the MHWPs across um, Birmingham and Solly Hall meets monthly, um, every Monday of the month. Um, we bring an agenda and everyone can add to that. And we, you know, we speak about what's going on, things are going well, things that aren't going well. It's a practitioner led online network. So it aims to foster just regular engaging meetings, covering a wide range of topics relevant to the MHWPs. We encourage networking, knowledge sharing and collaboration. And I think that genuinely brings me to the end. Thank you so much, um, everybody. And I hope you enjoyed. Fantastic and excellent TikTok there. Really <laughs> enjoyed that. Um, does anybody have any questions about MHWP as our newest practitioner course? Oh, sorry, the chat. Aaron's put something in the chat. Apologies, Aaron. I was forgot to man the chat. Um, a very, very valid question. Is there any overlap between this role and the CAP role, which is the clinical associate role, which is an, a, a more of an apprenticeship route? Um, I won't personally pretend to be an expert in the CAP role. So if anybody wants to uh, weigh in, please do. But my understanding is, yes, there is uh, quite a bit of overlap. It's just the uh, level and the depth of training that is a little bit different. So the practitioners are the band fives with the one year university course. And I believe the caps is 18 months, I think. And then they're band six. They have a band six role. So they just work in a slightly different way. Um, and I believe they do some caps do have some research and administrative tasks that our MHWPs don't. Um, they're slightly more kind of patient focused and therapeutic focused, whereas the cap is more aligned to sort of the psychologist, I suppose, in the service. If anyone has got anything to add, please, please do feel free. We don't do the cap at Worcester. So that is my tagline knowledge on that subject. Yeah, I'm, I'm no expert either, Marianne, but I, I think <laughs> you're correct in what you've you've said. I think that the, the cap role is, is certainly more aligned to the the, the psychological, uh, sorry, to the um, clinical psychology kind of grouping, um, albeit you know they're very narrow in focus, but kind of quite deep in uh, uh, in level of intervention. Yeah, it's a, I know it's a longer training course as well, so I would assume then that does mean they work at that slightly higher level. Um, yeah. Anything else about MHWPs? Lots of thanks in the chat, which is always nice. So I guess just to pick up on the, the similarities and the differences again with the MHWP role that you can see from the fantastic presentation, MHWPs are working with a slightly more complex client group really from, from the PWPs, which has been the biggest difference between them. So there are clients with diagnosis of psychosis, bipolar, that the MHWPs do work with and they are part of the intervention pathway, which is why it's so valuable that they sit in on MDTs, whereas in the PWPs, and I, I can't, I don't know too much, so Dom can correct me if I'm wrong, you've got a little bit more of a pathway and you do that sort of mild to moderate, although we know it's not actually mild to moderate most of the time, but you're aimed at that slightly different population, whereas the MHWPs are in CMHTs, embedded in those communities, working with the severe mental health. So it's a slightly different 
type of presentation they're working with, but in a very similar way, as you heard, I think BA and graded exposure seem to go across all the roles as interventions, um, but the eating disorders and the emotional regulations seem to be a little bit different. So I think in terms of future CPD for this community of practice, there's got to be some real scope in upskilling all of your, all the practitioner roles in these interventions. And I think even if it's like Ali and other Lisa and other education providers about, you know, using our teaching, that we can deliver that teaching across the practitioner roles to upskill the workforce, it, it I think would be really valuable for this space. Any of the CYPs want to be brave enough to tell us a little bit about your role? We would be so grateful. Um, we can't see the, not that I'm going to call anybody out by name, that would be awful, wouldn't it? But I know there's six, I think, James, you said there's was six CYPs here. I thought we had a yip as well, but I, I thought oh. I'm wrong. I, 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 I um, thought we had, but yeah, I, I, I must have... Uh, uh, misread the the chart when it first flagged up okay i believe is yip still in pilot phase that would it is it is still in pilot so that would I, be impressive if we got a yip i would be really proud of us it would yeah okay. turning into sort of well-being practitioner pokemon <laughs> <laughs> there are too many uh, variations of WHP that is <laughs> like the, the most difficult part of this. If we don't have anyone from CYP, that, that's completely fine. We, we did give you all of 10 minutes notice. Um, we can maybe send out some information about the role or some links. Oh, well, James said if you if you click on the PPM website, it will take you to um, information about the role. So everyone can maybe have a little bit of a look in their own time. Um, we are scheduled for a break after this to have a screen break until Sunny comes. Um, if James or Nicola can remind me what time Sunny is coming. Uh, five to. Five to. OK, so we've got about 30 minutes. Shall we go to the break? Does anybody else have any comments they want to say about the practitioner roles just as an open forum? And I guess just generally about the community of practice uh overall you know in terms of what they want to kind of i know we're going to have breakout discussions for that shortly but uh we may as well use this time for any discussion that anyone wants to wants to bring up can i just say as a mental health practitioner it is really interesting to hear about other roles especially the ones done um before us and it's like uh, louise said it is like a pokemon i do feel like we are kind of a pokemon we just the evolution with it and it's just really interesting to see how we do have like similar curriculums but we all do different things it it is i really enjoying this session today thank you thanks jess and lovely to hear from you i didn't see your name on the list um yeah absolutely i would i would echo that completely i think it's there's more, we're more similar than we think. I think that's one of the first things Louise said to me when she said, we need a community of practice. We are all more similar than we think. So that's always nice to think about. I was just thinking to add on to that, uh, Marianne, we also talked quite a lot about how, I know there's parts of the curriculum that you teach above and beyond on your course, because even though like, like Lou Jones said, at, PWPs don't work with social anxiety and they don't work with PTSD. We do have to still assess mm. those interventions. So, so there is kind of lots of different crossover that even though our scopes are defined, we still have to do other things. We still have to identify PTSD, for example, from an assessment. Mm. And I know you were kind of saying as well that in your course, you teach other things to your EMHPs because you know that they'll come across it in their practice. Yes, we have recently started to teach anxiety management and behaviour experiments to the MHWPs, because even though it's not in the curriculum, we know they get anxiety. Well, we have heard that there's, it's interesting, we talked about this, didn't we? There's no worry management on the MHWP course. And I know for PWPs, that's 
like such a core of what you do and I, I you know looking at Dom I think EMHPs do worry and anxiety as well and we just don't have it and it's interesting as where those decisions come from um I suppose it's not wanting to cram everything into that one year and try and teach you 20 different interventions in the space of 12 months but I think future CPD has got there's got to be a benefit to people knowing more interventions and learning more presentations and what to treat definitely can i just say on that note that really interestingly on my team so i work for early intervention on psychosis a lot of people ask me oh could you do some worry work and i find it really interesting that i keep being asked to do things are not in the curriculum mm. but they just expect you to do it when you explain the role and they get really yeah. confused when you say, oh, I wasn't trained to do that. Can I do this instead? <laughs> They're like, oh, OK. Yeah, where well, it becomes a pick a mix. Yeah, Dom, go for it. Yeah, I mean, first, I just want to say thank you guys to, for sort of bringing everyone together today and sort of sharing some information about what everybody does, but also about what the PPN is and, and sort of what's coming with that. Um, I, I think just sort of following on from the previous note as well, I think sometimes there are things which we are asked to offer within service but we're not necessarily trained to do but then especially now that we're starting to get much tighter and and rigid on on what we can and can't offer as in it wasn't trained at university level so we can't offer it yeah. <clears throat> i think the ppn will be a really good opportunity to actually feedback that can we start putting some of that cpd in place so that you know, for, for, for some really simple well i say really simple some relatively yeah. simple things which as a certainly as like a uh, a a children adolescent um, worker you know you need to be doing emotional reg all the time and so i think sort of emotional regulation stuff it would be really nice if there was like cpd on on those sorts of things and other interventions which maybe aren't an entire intervention on their own but could be used in conjunction with other things it would be really beneficial to do that it seems a shame and a little bit <clears throat> a little bit sort of static to say what well, it wasn't taught at your one year in university so you can't offer it. I understand in terms of sort of like higher level stuff we don't want to be offering outside of our criteria but um, yeah it'd be really nice to kind of start having some conversations about that and seeing what we can do to to continually develop within our roles and, and offer that um, increase that service offering. Um, yeah just to quickly jump in there yeah I completely agree and I guess there's a bit of a tension between um, you know the upskilling element of and what's safe to kind of introduce within your scope of practice and you know that which sits outside of the curriculum which might just be beyond uh, what's appropriate to deliver and and you know that's something that needs a bit more exploration and uh, i'm i'm not um a psychological i'm not a psychological practitioner in any any shape or form so um you know you're all much more um geared up to know and understand that than me And um, Lisa, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you. I was just kind of almost like a sidestep, really, just thinking about those of us who do work in purely adult services. Often it can be really difficult because, as we know, patients don't fit into nice, neat little step two boxes. And often some of the difficulties that we're working with are that their children, the, the adults that we're working with, their children actually really struggling. And as we know, there are so many difficulties within CAMS or with children's services generally. So I think something like this can be really helpful in terms of signposting, in terms of knowing actually there are other services that can be offered. I know something about it. I'm not trained in it, obviously, because I'm trained to work with adults. However, here is somewhere where you can get some information and this is what's coming um, and, you know, and speak to your schools. So I just think it's really helpful to share, as you said, share the knowledge. And that's been really, really useful today. Yeah. Louise, do you want to come in? Yeah, sorry, I was just um, just quite rightly from, from what Lisa said that I know from feedback from um, PWPs, one of the hardest things we find is that 16 to 18 year old group and actually how we engage 16 to 18 year olds. So when we've got a community of practice and that's what people do on a day to day basis, it'd be great to share kind of some of that knowledge to really help us with our client group as well. I was also going to mention as well that going forward I know later on we're going to talk about kind of future ideas about where the community of practice can go but I guess in the back of my mind as well there's also the opportunities as a group to kind of think about any research projects we want to do there's a big push at the moment for psychological practitioners not being represented in research 
So with such a, a big group of us and so vast and varied expertise, this seems like a brilliant place to kind of come up with those ideas. And like James said, we could also have subgroups away from that separate community of practices working on research and using the PPN to kind of support that as well. Oh, yes. Every time an MHWP or a PWP or an EMHC tries to write an academic essay, you're desperately pulling on high intensity, trying to apply it to your low intensity. So absolutely, we could create some references for future trainees to use in their assignments. Definitely. Any other comments about anything, <laughs> really? Or is everybody just desperate for a cup of tea and the toilet? In which case we can absolutely pause it there. It is uh, Louise has just nodded at me. So it's 25 to now. So if Sunny is coming at 5 to, if we just all make sure that we're back here at just before 5 to and ready so that she doesn't come onto the empty screen, then uh, we'll, we'll be good to go. So uh, thank you everybody for your attention. That was absolutely wonderful and it sounds like everyone's really benefiting from it. So we'll see you in a bit.